the way that Putin is doing it is by killing a few dozen people in very dramatic ways. But what he's not doing, of course, is what Stalin's doing. I mean, he's not going through mass terror. He's not rounding up a million people. He's not killing tens of thousands of people. Yeah. And I, when we don't we don't maybe talk enough about this, but it's also true with populism. I mean, Viktor Orban again. Welcome to The Rest is Politics with me, Alistair Campbell. And with me, Rory Stewart. And, and nice to see you, Alistair. Nice to see you. I'm talking to you from the United States. I'm looking at you from the United Kingdom. Yeah, very good. You just got back from France. Just back from, just back from La Belle France. You can tell us a bit about what's happening with Marine Le Pen and Macron, and maybe I can chip in a little bit on Trump, and we can discuss France and America as well as other stuff, right? Well, actually, the thing I want to discuss is what's going on in a little place called Mayotte, which is a little-known, fully-fledged French département off the east of Africa, which is all sorts of stuff kicking off there, but it actually does relate to domestic politics as well. We're obviously going to have, we should kick off with Navalny and Russia, uh, lots going on at the Munich Security Conference, uh, which I think we should cover, and as you say, a bit of France and a bit of America. But first of all, Rory, shall we just thank the, actually, many thousands already who have bought tickets for our October, we think, election tour. There's still some tour <laughs> soon that might, might go for May, just put himself out of his misery, but I think we're still banking on the autumn. Just on that for a second, never seems to me that it's very plausible that the reason why a prime minister would call an election is to put themselves out of their misery. I mean, it doesn't seem like a very likely reason to do something. No, but what might be likely is if he thinks that, for example, terrible local elections assuming they are going to have terrible local elections. And then all this sort of rather low-level talk about, look, you know, should we try and have a sixth prime minister uh, before the next election, that actually it might kick off. It just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, I'm willing to, to, Rory, to lay a lot did of Liz Truss make it. sense? No, but... but did but No think, Deal Brexit but, make sense? No, it didn't. But put it this way, he is not going to be prime minister beyond the end of the year. This is his one shot in life to be prime minister. Why would he cut it short by six, seven months? When, if he goes to an election in May, he is absolutely destined to lose. And and the only way it would happen, presumably, is if he was under a massive rebellion in his party with huge numbers of MPs flooding and begging him to do a May election. But I'm not getting that sense. No, but you are getting quite more and more of them sort of muttering that, you know, he can't do the job and he's not very good and he's not going down very well with the public, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that's them all preparing, isn't it, for leadership? I mean, it's a we should get onto that at some point, but there's mm. so much manoeuvring going because they're all assuming that he'll lose the election. And so all these people are trying to position themselves to be the next leader, aren't they? Anyway, Roy, while we're droning on about this, the um, uh, producers are putting endless messages into the chat box saying, if you want to buy tickets, go to therestispolitics.com. Yeah. And, and sorry, on, on that side, very... Uh, central to this is that we've decided not just to play the Albert Hall this year, but we're playing the O2 Arena. So it's going to be very, very exciting. It's going to be the biggest live podcast thing ever done in the world, says he going out on a limb. And uh, so Probably please come on. It should, <laughs> should, be, should be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Um, we've already sold more tickets than we did uh, at the Albert Hall, uh, but there are still some tickets to go. So come along and it'll be really fun. Good. Okay. Now, shall we start with Alexei Navalny, RIP. Do you know what I want to, where I want to start with this, Roy, is the theme of, of courage. When we interviewed Anthony Scaramucci last week on leading, do you remember he had that line about John F. Kennedy wrote a book called Profiles in Political Courage, and he was asked why it was so short, and he said because he didn't find many people who had real courage. I've been sort of, there's, I've been thinking lots about Navalny and, and about what it means for, for Russia and what it means for you know, America and, and all the sort of different facets that, that flow from it. But I sort of, one question I ask myself is, what would the limits of one's own courage be? Because um, I remember when he and his wife flew back, when he'd been, you know, they tried to wipe him out as they did with Litvinenko, as they tried to do with Skripal, uh, as they d have done with others. And he survived. And if you remember, he was treated uh, for the poisoning that they inflicted upon him in, in the Charite, Charite, Charite Hospital in Berlin. And then he decided to go back. So there's a guy who 
gets on a plane, having been poisoned, having survived, is determined to leave his wife and two kids behind uh, and go back to Russia when everybody is saying he will be arrested immediately and flung in jail on all sorts of trumped up charges and is risking his life, but he was determined to do it. So I was thinking, is there, are there any circumstances in which I might do something like that? And I think the answer is probably no, which is what makes him so rare. Do, do you think there were, um, there were moments in your life when you would have been more more likely to do it, maybe when you were when you were younger. I mean, is it? Well, I can't think of the. I guess this is you know we do at least live in a in a in a freedom, as it were. So I, I've never I've never known that feeling as to what that would be like to go somewhere where you will not feel free. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I don't think any of us really know these things until we get properly tested. I mean, I think I've always had moral courage and physical courage up to a point. But I think the thought of leaving wife, kids into such uncertainty is, I think, you know, I think that's why people have been so moved and so touched by this. And, you know, because the fact is, I mean, we've mentioned John Sweeney before on the podcast and he wrote a book, Killer in the Kremlin. There have been a lot of assassinations. There have been a lot of state-sponsored murders in different parts of the world. Apparently, there's been another one in, that's just taken place in Spain of a defector. And so, I don't know. I just, I just think it is, in, it is an incredible act of courage. It is incredible, isn't it? And, and it's part of a bigger theme of the sort of courage you need to be a politician in, in many countries in the world. I mean, if you think at of, we were talking about Pakistan last week. We were talking about Imran yeah. Khan, who's now in jail and extended sentences. But remember that Bilawal Bhutto, who was the foreign minister until recently, his mother was assassinated. His mm. grandfather was executed. There were assassination attempts against Imran Khan. So th there are those environments in which you really do feel that being a politician, or I mean, obviously, if you go back in, in time, if you're an ancient Roman, um, the chance is pretty high that you were going to end up getting shot, but we're not, we're not used to that. And I think the, one of the reasons why I'm so full of contempt for the American senators and congressmen of the Republican party who did not come out against Trump is that the stakes in our society are so much lower. I and mean, what's mm. the worst that could happen if you came out against Trump, you might you know lose your seat and go and get a lobbying job or something. Um, and here we have an example of somebody who, yeah, went knowing there was a very, very good chance that he would be killed um, because, as you say, they had actually tried to kill him. I mean, he'd only just come out of a coma from the Russian security forces putting yeah. putting this um, Novichok in his underwear on a plane. And when he was back in prison pretty quickly, they were subjecting him to sleep deprivation again, depriving him of medical care. Uh, almost killed him a couple of years ago in prison. So mm. it's um, no, it's 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 absolutely unbelievable. So when we talk about courage, so you know, you and I can sit here and we can slag off Donald Trump, we can slag off Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak and anybody we want. And although I do feel there are there are sort of signs of, you know, really kind of anti politics, anti political thought and, and conduct in Britain at the moment. Nothing, nothing like happens in a, a dictatorship like Russia. And I read bef the day before Navalny was killed, I did, I was reading um, a piece on in an old foreign policy magazine by a guy called Alexei Min, M-I-N-I-A-I-L-O. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. And he founded something called Chronicles, which tries to do opinion polling in Russia. And I don't know how they do it, but they they claim that it's a much more accurate form of, of polling. And he's an opposition figure. He's an, he's an activist. And so he runs this thing called Chronicles. And he wrote this lo really long piece about what it's like to be a figure of opposition in modern Russia. And it's very, 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 very difficult. And it's very, very, very scary. And it's, you know, so... And it's, it's, it's kind of chilling it now. This was just written just before, I think it was just before Christmas this came out. So he's listing some of the people who've been killed, you know, journalists who've been killed, Boris Nemtsov famously near the Kremlin in 2015, 
Uh, he mentions Vladimir Karamurza, who's you know well known to quite a lot of people in Britain, who's currently in jail. And he and he says Ale- Alexei Navalny, Russia's most famous opposition leader, barely survived being poisoned by the FSB, and today he's in prison. Well, of course that's now outdated. Today he's dead, and his mother. I don't know if you saw today, Roy. His mother did a, a piece to camera outside the prison in this or god awful part of the world minus 26 degrees she's not being given access to the body and then the wife the widow and and not being given access to the body people believe because almost certainly it's still got toxic substances in it i mean it's it, it's another sort of at least the regime is implying that they poisoned him by not allowing access to the body there's no other reason not to give access to well the, the other the other thing that they do is they they go through the the processes the motions they so what you've um I heard a, a review on German radio of how this was being reported in, in Russia. And of course, there's, hard, there's next to nothing about Navalny. Uh, the big story has been this sort of, you know, this advance that they're making in the, in the war and the heroic soldiers who've just taken this place that they've been fighting over. And very, very little about Navalny. But what they will then do is put out a statement saying that there's been a thorough investigation and... You know, so what what the three days will be doing is about so as they can say there's been an investigation, then they'll give a cause of death, which goes beyond what they said on day one, which was sudden death syndrome, which yeah. was announced by Peskov, by the way, Putin's spokesman, very, very, mm-hmm. very soon yeah. after the death. So I think there's part of the Russian Putin establishment that wants actually wants us to think they've done it, and then they go out and deny it. But what it does is spread that fear. So it goes back to this point about courage. If you're an opposition figure in Russia today, does this make you more or less likely to campaign against Putin? Well, that would depend on what sort of personality you were. But then his wife, his widow, Yulia, mm. goes out, makes two. She was at the Munich Security Conference. She gets a standing mm. ovation when she spoke on the day that his body was found, that they announced he was dead. Mm-hmm. She then did another piece to camera yesterday where she said she was going to carry on his work. She went on Twitter. Uh, I don't know what's going on there because it seems that her account was was suspended, suspended today. Yeah. Maybe a, a brief explainer on uh, Navalny for for listeners. I think people will have heard quite a lot about him, but he is a very, very. He was a, a really fascinating character. So he half Ukrainian, half Russian. Father was a military officer. Went off to a university that's called the Patrice Lumumba University. So it was the university. One of, the, one of the best universities in, in Russia, but it was set up with a l- strong focus on training revolutionaries from the developing world in the 60s and 70s. Became a lawyer. Joined the mainstream liberal party of the day. So he, he, he went into this party called Yabloko, which was led by Grigory Yavlinsky, who we can talk mm. about a little bit more, and then broke with him. Became in the late 2000s, flirted with nationalism, talked a lot about anti-immigration. And that's one of the reasons he broke with the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party, in fact, thought that he'd become a populist um, and didn't like the fact that he was attacking migrants and that um, uh, Navalny was out there making comments attacking Georgians. And he was pretty ambivalent about uh, Crimea. He didn't come out strongly against the Russian invasion of Crimea in 2014. And he went on these marches with far right nationalists. So there was there was that phase in his life. But by 2011, he was really getting going as a very active politician, and a very active politician, driven by the use of the internet. I mean, mm. he was one of the first real e politicians. So he had this blog, which, if people are interested in, we can put a link up. You can read some of the English translations of the blog. Huge focus on anti-corruption. So a lot of what he did was around anti-corruption. Really smart use of video. He produced a video on Putin's Dacha, the one that you describe actually and that you saw, mm. um, which had about 120 million views. And Putin then denied that he lived in anything like that. So maybe we should get you out testifying that he did indeed live in live in such a place. Well, I, I don't. I don't know if it was the one. It was one of the ones. <laughs> right. Um, and it was. It was. People should watch if they haven't already. They should watch the. Um, the, the the film because it, it is a brilliant piece of journalism and because he you know very handsome guy very very easy on the eye very good sort of talking to camera without a script 
uh, but it was brilliantly researched, brilliantly presented. And the, by the way, Rory, you talked about um, about the, the the lack of respect for for Americans who sort of you know scared to stand up to Trump. But just before we started recording, I was I saw a, th- a thing on on CNN, and it was an interview with the a guy called Andrew Hitt, who's the ex chairman of of the Republican Party in Wisconsin, and he was being interviewed by CNN, and he basically said he went along with this fake electors plot, and he said that he was worried that if he didn't go along with it, he was in he was in in fear of his life because of the anger that Trump was whipping up at the time. So, and Trump, I don't know if you saw Trump's reaction to Navalny. I mean, Putin, needless to say, has said has said nothing. But I'll just read you Trump's reaction. The sudden death of Alexei Navalny, okay, get it? The sudden death has made me, let's talk about myself, more and more aware of what is happening in our country. It is a slow, steady progression with crooked, in caps, Radical left politicians, prosecutors, and judges leading us down a path to destruction. Open borders, rigged elections, grossly unfair courtroom decisions are, we're back into capital letters, destroying America. We are a nation in decline, a failing nation, exclamation mark, MAGA 2024. This is something we've talked about before, and I think it's really important, which is that there is something Trump can exploit here. We've talked about how regimes uh, up and down the world use lawfare use the courts as a way of going after their opponents. So four weeks ago, we talked about how in Bangladesh, 1.2 million members of the opposition party are tied up in the courts. Yeah, We talked about how in many Latin American countries, as soon as you're out of office, you're immediately prosecuted for corruption and the judges go after you. We talked about how in Pakistan, uh, Imran Khan is currently in jail because the judges have gone after him and they went after his predecessors. And of course, Navalny, a very extreme example of this. I mean, he was... 2011, they put out an arrest warrant. Uh, 2013, he was running for Moscow mayor and they sentenced him to prison. Then the regime decided to let him out because they wanted to, it seems, they liked the idea of pluralism in the election. And then they were horrified by how well he did. And then, of course, they've put him uh, put him in jail again. In fact, he was due to serve an additional 19 years till 2038. Mm. Now, the problem with all of that is, of course, that if it becomes the norm that judges are used to go after your political opponents. That, of course, provides a huge opportunity for the Trumps this world when the judges go after them to say this whole thing is politically motivated, which is why I personally believe it's been a big mistake for the Democrats to put so much weight on these legal cases, particularly when there's like 97 of them. By the time there's 97 of them, most Trump voters, quite understandably, are going to say, this is ludicrous. How can he possibly have that number of cases against him? This must be politically motivated. Yeah, Rory, you've just had one where he's been fined, whatever it was, hundreds of millions of dollars because a court of law. I mean, America is meant to be a country governed by the rule of law. I don't think we should be making direct comparisons with some of the countries that you talked about, least of all Russia. I absolutely agree. It's governed by the rule of law. It's not uh, anything like Russia, but it is just... One of the reasons why, as you've pointed out, every time he appears in the witness box, his support goes up. Yeah, but is that the number of number of these cases makes it feel to his base as though this is politically motivated, and you can understand and you can understand why it feels like that because there's so many of these cases. Yeah, but then there's a danger. Yeah, but that's because that that could be Rory because he's a serial lawbreaker. I mean, and also because so many of so many of the so much of the law in America is done state by state, so. If if you go through uh, something as complicated as what happened in in after the election and the insurrection on the Capitol, so for example, I've just been mentioning Wisconsin. Um, there's the, the, I don't know if there's a case going on in Wisconsin, but there's one state where this guy is saying he was doing something which he knew was wrong, which he knew was was not true. This in this fake electors plot. Now that's a crime. So surely, if you're in, well, if you well, believe in the rule of law. Okay, well, Prosecutors have to go after that. I suppose my point is that it's a bit more complicated than that. A lot of Democrats and a lot of Democrat donors have been funding these cases as a way of stopping him. And I, I've been to conferences in the US because I'm broadly on the Biden's. I'm, I am. I'm on the Democrat side in this. So I, I go to a lot of meetings where the prosecutors stand up and are cheered and applauded and everyone loves the work that lawyers are doing to get Trump. Mm. I guess my point is, though, that it feels to me like a political mistake 
they thought this was a real move of genius, which was going to guarantee the discrediting of Trump. And I think politically, actually, the result's been the opposite. Yeah, it still might, though. I mean, you know, if, if, if we go back to the interview with, uh, with Anthony Scaramucci, when he gave his reasons why he thinks Trump is going to lose, he did say he thinks the country will get the sort of, you know, the drip drip of these court cases. And we're talking, you know, the one that happened last week, where he's been banned from running a business for three years. He's got to have this sort of supervisor over, overseeing all the that's going on within the Trump empire. His two sons have been banned for two years, all because he did what, you know, I think everybody always knew that Trump did was to sort of inflate his worth when it suited him and deflate his worth when it suited him. And the and by the way, the judgment, I don't know if you read it, but I mean, he, I, I was surprised. There was one sentence where he basically said, that Trump was pathological, um, which, you know, I, and I think if, if you're a judge, look, I think we both agree that it would be far better if you didn't have judges that were labeled politically, uh, but that's the system that they have. Um, but it, but ju just, uh, just to go back to, to Navalny, I, I yeah. think this, this thing about how does an opposition galvanize itself when it's had its lead the, the, why did he take out Nemtsov because he was a leader why is he taking out Navalny because he was a leader where do leaders emerge from um will his wife be able to to fill that gap I mean it, it, it just becomes so I think Putin will be sitting there not giving a damn what west what world leaders other world leaders are saying um knowing that people will move on pretty quickly because I'm afraid that's what they do and meanwhile, people in Russia who do want to, like the guy I quoted from Chronicles, who do want to sort of keep an opposition going, feeling, I suspect, more and more intimidated, more and more scared. Yeah. There's nothing they can do to wait till Putin pops his clogs. It's also an interesting thing, isn't it, that the modern face of authoritarianism and populism is different from what it was in the past. So the way that Putin is doing it is by killing a few dozen people in very dramatic ways. You know, he'll blow up an aeroplane, he'll put some amazing um, radioactive substance, which only security services can make into somebody's underpants or their drink. But what he's not doing, of course, is what Stalin's doing. I mean, he's not going through mass terror, he's not rounding up a million people, he's not killing tens of thousands of people. Yeah. And I, well, we don't, we don't maybe talk enough about this, but it's also true with populism. I mean, Viktor Orban, again, in Hungary, is a very nasty piece of work, but he's not mass jailing journalists. These regimes use different techniques now. I mean, they're... They're, yeah, they're, more, um, they're, they're more subtle, but, but, you know, I think with Putin, for example, you know, we, 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 we have to put our hands up to this. When, when he first came on the scene, when I mentioned John Sweeney, I, I've told you before about when John Sweeney, uh, Putin's very first visit, First press conference he ever did with Tony Blair. I remember John Sweeney saying, "You have got no idea what you're dealing with here," and um, you know he's been he's been proved right. Um, I think there was a sense that people were were sort of seeing the Putin and the Russia that that we wanted to see, as opposed to what you know maybe we should have just been taking him at face value some of the things that he was saying and doing. Um, the, but the, the, the guy, just the guy, briefly yeah, go yeah, the Rory, yeah, the guy in, yeah. in in Spain is a yeah. guy. A Russian pilot, Maxim Kuzminov, who defected to the Ukrainian side, um, and he's been found dead in a car park in Spain. And I think bringing together all the names of people who've been killed by Putin, reminding people, as you say, about Nemtsov, but also Larissa Yubina, who was an investigative journalist back in '98, Yuri Shchekokochichin, who was an MP who was um, killed in 2003 with an allergic reaction. Um, and the problem that these parties have, I, I've been reading quite a lot by a man called Grigory Yavlinsky. Some people will have heard of him because he was a presidential candidate and was almost prime minister. And he was the big leader of this liberal party, Yablko, and yeah. who then ended up in an, in an argument with Navalny. Um, and he represents another approach to Russian opposition, which is to try to hold up to these quite austere liberal values. He encourages people not to go on demonstrations because he thinks they're just going to be beaten up by the security services. And he's, he's set out a, a platform trying to explain how he thinks Putin can be defeated. And, and the problem is when you look at it, 
you know, he's saying you, we need 900,000 election observers, we need more members of our party, we need petitions with 20 million signatures, we need candidates, we need funding. Basically, he's betting the House on trying to play by the rules of a liberal democracy against a guy who's not a liberal Democrat. And yeah. he ends up looking entirely unrealistic. And you can see, in a sense, why Navalny, who was probably, it's true, more populist, more nationalistic, took more risk, um, got was beginning to develop more momentum. Mm, which is why he's taken him out. Um, just to, just on the this guy from this thing, Chronicles, um, yeah. and as I say, I don't know how they do these polls, um, but they wh- one of the, the findings they had they said, according to our team's phone polls, more Russians want the state to prioritise social spending over military spending. 46% would rather have money spent on social services than the military. 47% empathize with people who try to dodge military service. 36% condemn their behavior. Um, now, I don't know how you do those polls, but it's it's an interesting perspective. And also somebody like him, I mean, even as I was reading it, I was thinking, well, <laughs> how does this guy operate? He 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 bills himself as a critic, as an activist, as a critic of the government, as a critic of the war in Ukraine, where if you call it a war rather than a special military operation, you can go to jail and journalists have gone to jail for, for that. Yeah. The, the other thing I think that we've sometimes missed is we've got that Putin's Russia is an authoritarian regime and Xi Jinping's China is an authoritarian regime, but we're missing the extent to which they've got more closed, more repressive over the last couple of decades. That if you talk to journalists who were reporting in China 10 years ago, they were much freer. People are now much more frightened to talk to them. Mm. Again, Russia, people were much more outspoken. It's much easier to conduct proper opinion polls 10 years ago than it is today. And and final thing, I, I, I there's a big picture of Alexei Navalny now up in, I, I'm at Yale University at the moment teaching and outside the classroom I was in yesterday, big picture of him because he was a fellow here at Yale in 2010. And very interestingly, along with the mayor of Bristol, uh, Marvin Marvin. Rees, and also a uh, Lebanese politician, female politician, who at some point I'd be interested in maybe getting them on, maybe not so much to talk about Navalny, although Marvin became quite close to to Alexei Navalny. Um, uh, Marvin, mayor of Bristol, was given lifts by him. They spent many evenings together discussing how Navalny was going to campaign. So I, I I think it, it, he is really missed here. And the sense that one gets is that he was just a very smart, charismatic, inspiring, funny mm. guy. And But but w- what you said at the beginning, I think, is the most important thing. A man of completely stupendous courage. I mean, mm. he, he essentially went to what was an almost certain martyrdom. Yeah. Now, the Munich Security Conference we mentioned where his wife, now widow, uh, spoke on the day that his death was was announced. And inter- I mean, Munich Security Conference is a is kind of an interesting gathering. And 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 I, I suppose this year, the main themes, I guess, there was a lot of kind of what do we do if Trump wins? There was obviously a lot about the Middle East and what is going to happen there. There was a lot about Ukraine, and and there's been some interesting developments on on Ukraine, not just the Russian advance, but um, I thought, for me, one of the most interesting things was the Danish government um, announcing that they were going to be giving all of their, uh, I think it was all of their artillery, to Ukraine. Um, yeah, and, there is, and there did seem to be in Munich a sense of, of, of movement on this. Ursula von der Leyen was talking about their, perhaps the need for a European defence commissioner. There's a big debate going on in Germany post-Trump's speech about NATO about whether the Germans should think about finally accepting Macron's offer for Germany, as it were, to, to come under the French nuclear umbrella. Um, so that debate is going on. Um, and the smaller Baltic countries, I think, really calling out the bigger ones in, in saying, look, do you do realize if, if Ukraine is allowed to lose this war, do not think that he stops there. He will not stop there. It's also, I think, been very disappointing so Munich happens February every year, been going since 1963. And, you know, five, six years ago, it would have been talking about Iraq and Afghanistan. Now it's very, very focused 
on Russia and Ukraine. But people hoped when they turned up that this might be a turning point, that Trump's comments about NATO, that the attack on Avdivka, the killing of Alexei Navalny, for which incidentally Biden had said that would be unprecedented consequences. He told Putin this in 2021 if Navalny was killed. Mm. So people thought, okay, now we're coming. This could be the moment where there's going to be a real sense of urgency. People are going to really step up and grip it. And you're right, there's been some stuff around the edges, but the fundamental story is Macron didn't turn up. Kamala Harris and Schultz were pretty unimpressive. And there's just a loss of chat, but there's not a real sense that that Europe's remotely stepping up. I mean, they're all saying that it's going to take almost five years before they can get in a fighting state. Turns out that Germans promising to manufacture missiles, very, very slow. A few thousand missiles are going to be produced over the next year. And I mm. think a lot of people left it thinking, God, this is pathetic. Where is the leadership? Mm. You know, where is somebody actually saying, we're going to grip this, we're going to prioritize this? And, and, and it's completely at odds with the fact that, as you say, the Danes are handing stuff over and saying they think that Russia could attack another European country within three to five years. You've got the Germans and Estonians saying maybe five to seven years. So you would have thought that really would wake people up. Um, so one question I had, I guess, is now that you know I'm beginning to get you around on my point of view that Keir Starmer is inevitably the next prime minister, do you think that if he turns up to the Munich Security Conference in February next year, he has the kind of personality and outlook to really play that kind of leadership role and galvanize and give the sense of urgency that people are lacking. You're absolutely right that, it, that we, we need it. There's a guy you probably know called Mujtaba Rahman, who writes yes. these very, very interesting analysis for something called Eurasia Group. Um, and he, he actually, in, in the one that he's written this week, as, as I hadn't seen anything about this in the in the UK media, but that's maybe because I've been I've been away. But he said that quite a lot of the talk at Munich was about the possibility of a sort of EU UK defence partnership. Um, now I saw Keir Starmer was at Munich with David Lammy, and somebody published a list of of all the people they'd seen him sort of meeting. Uh, President of the Czech Republic, Ursula von der Leyen, President of the Commission, Alexander Stubb, the new President-elect of Finland, Leo Varadkar, uh, Scholz, Chancellor of Germany, Stoltenberg, General Secretary of NATO, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken, Prime Minister of Qatar, Foreign Minister of Saudi Arabia, and on and on it goes. So I think what that tells you is that the people who were there were thinking, this guy is the next Prime Minister. This probably yeah, is probably yeah, the yeah, next yeah, Prime Minister. Yeah. Um, now, and I, 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 I really hope that Labour make foreign policy and defence a big thing, because I think people understand that the world is more dangerous, more complicated, that a lot of this stuff can only be done internationally. And I think if we do get a change of government, and I'm, by the way, Rory, I'm always going to say if, and I'm <laughs> never going to say when, if and when we do get a Labour government, I th I think that the, the this this issue of sort of you know global security, our own security, defence in Europe, these big foreign policy alliances, I think they can become a big part of a, of the agenda for a first term Labour government. And it, and, and it could be very interesting um, to really see Keir Starmer lean into this over the next few months. I mean, there's no reason actually why he couldn't begin taking a big leadership position on this. Absolutely. Even before he became prime minister, I mean, in the way that you know, famously Churchill from the back bench has led the whole shift in policy towards Germany without being, yeah, being in government. I hope they do. I, I can, I, I can see there'll be some Labour strategists if they're listening to this, thinking, oh, you know, we've got to focus on the cost of living, on the health service, etc. But actually, one of the big things that will decide the extent to which people decide to give Labour a decent sized majority is the whole thing about leadership. Um, and interestingly, I, I, I can, I've read the, this new book that's coming out about Keir. Tom Baldwin has written, um, he was going to write, he was going to ghost a book by Keir Starmer. And you, you, your only experience in ghosting, I'm right, is that you were once approached to ghost Narendra Modi. Is that right? <laughs> the, two, the two ghost things that, that I narrowly avoided, one was Narendra Modi and one was Roy Keane. 
Yeah, uh, um, Roy Keane. I thought you were going to say Robert Maxwell. It's no, Roy Keane. Roy Keane. Yeah. Um, uh, Roy Keane's lawyer approached me about that one, but ni- neither of them got off, got off the ground. But no, so Tom Baldwin has, has written this this book, Keir Starmer, The Biography, which I've read twice now because I, 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 full disclosure, Tom is a good friend of mine and, 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 and I've worked with him, you know, when we were at the People's Vote campaign together. But I, but I think, you know, a lot of people say, well, I don't really know who Keir Starmer is. I don't know where it's coming from. This, I think this book will, for people like you and me that, you know, want to really get deep into stuff, I think people will find it very, very interesting. Very interesting about his childhood. I mean, I know you're obsessed with father-son relationships and their impact upon people. Very, very, it's hard to describe it, but very difficult relationship with his father, I would say. Tell us a bit about it. Give us, a, give us an example. Well, as, as Keir Nevertai is telling us, his father was a tool baker. Yep. Um but because his mother was so ill a lot of the time, his dad was really focused on that. And it's quite moving, actually, that when, when he died, he just felt that he'd never, he'd, he, 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 his, his dad only ever once said that he was proud of him. Um, also, the other thing, he's, he's got, you know, Tom's interviewed siblings and other relatives and friends going back to childhood. And, you know, I know Keir quite well, but I didn't know he, he, he's he, one of his, his brother has, has clearly got sort of special educational needs and was was sort of picked on. A strong kind of anti-bullying thing that keeps coming through. And the other thing that keeps coming through at sort of every stage of his life is just how utterly determined he is. So, you know, part of his childhood, determined to get away, goes to university, determined to become a lawyer, determined to become a top lawyer, determined to become a human rights lawyer becomes DPP, determined to become an MP, becomes MP. And, you know, there's one bit which I'm surprised the, I think the Times have been serialising it, but I thought they might have made more of the fact that even as the election, even as Corbyn's leadership was sort of, he was still leader, but Keir had a little group going where he was kind of, you know, quite busily planning. Um, So I think... To to be the the next leader. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, knowing that Corbyn would go, yeah. And 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 by the way, Roy, there's two things in here because, as you know, you're determined to get me to say when Labour win, yep. which I'm yep. not going to do, yep. and I'm determined to get you to say I will be voting Labour. Yeah. This book, here we are. Two things popped up in the last few pages. Yep. One is where it talks favourably about the possibility of citizens' assemblies as a possible oh, way of making policy. Oh, that's policy very exciting. Change. Yeah. Uh, and the other is um, a new ethics commission with a beefed up commitment to the Nolan principles enshrined in the min- oh, a new ministerial fantastic. code. Well, music to us. Well, I think what then maybe just, just to finish, if Keir Salmer is looking to play a really big international leadership role on defense, what he could do is take some of the script from Biden and Kamala Harris, which I think has got a great framing at the moment. They've talked about four things, wanting to be global instead of isolationist, international rules and norms instead of chaos, democratic instead of authoritarian, collective instead of unilateral. Mm. And it'd be lovely to see Keir really leaning into that and, and yeah. championing those principles. I mean, the only, the only really big speech he's made about foreign policy was, was about Israel, Gaza. And I think we've said before, it, it may became a little bit too late. And, you know, and, and we, we're recording this on Tuesday. You've got the vote in the Commons tomorrow with the SNP have put down this motion. Labour have now put down a motion echoing the call for a, an immediate ceasefire. Um, but I think, a, even including during the election campaign, I think a couple of big speeches about foreign policy, why it matters, the state of our defences, why we need to rethink the state of our defences, I think actually they're they're very big themes for him, and and those four um, principles that you that you you put out there they fit very much because what comes through the other thing that comes through in Tom's book is that Keir Starmer was a human rights lawyer out of conviction. He did loads and loads and loads of cases for nothing just because he wanted to help the little guy, whether it was the the McDonald's libel case, whether it was some of these guys on death row in different parts of the world. Um, so I think that whole thing about rules and order and collectivism, I think he should maybe, as you say, lean into that a lot more. Good. Thank you. Welcome back to The Rest is Politics with me, Rory Stewart. And me, Alistair Campbell. 
Alistair, one of the things which your extraordinary colourful friend Scaramucci, who's out on leading at the moment, are you getting um, uh, the positive feedback I'm getting? I, people really seem to have been taken with him. The gaffer, Gary Lineker, sent a message saying, think this is the most extraordinary interview I've ever listened to. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it's absolutely amazing. And then I was on the plane flying over here to the to the states just after we'd done that, and I was watching a really interesting documentary on Sam Bankman Fried. Sam Bankman Fried was the founder of this great crypto marketplace. Who spec- Fiona tech- and I have just Fiona and I have just been listening to the Michael Lewis book. Right. Okay. It was about that. So, exactly. And we, we talked a bit about him when he blew up, partly because he was an effective altruist and that connected to what I was doing with Give Directly, trying to raise money from his foundation and stuff. Anyway, the center of this whole story and interviewed again and again is your friend, Mr. Scaramucci, who was one of the earliest, strongest investors with Sam Bankman Freed, who flew out to the Bahamas and was with him as, an, as his entire business blew up. Wasn't Sam Bankman Freed an investor with him? I think it worked in both directions, but, both it, but, but, but it was such a close relationship. You know, Scaramucci flew out to the Bahamas to try to save the company in the last few hours. It blew up. I think Scaramucci takes more care over his parents than uh, Sam Bankman Freed. That's certainly true. But I also think that the odd thing about him, I, I mean, it, it was an extraordinary interview. He is so smart and his political judgment seems absolutely on the nail. But at yeah. the same time, his judgment in the people he associates with, you know, Donald Trump and Sam Bankman-Fried is pretty questionable. So there's this sort of odd, odd thing going on where he seems to be a really good political analyst, but has pretty catastrophic judgment of people. Yeah, but he said he wasn't a politician. He sort of, he ended up in the White House, you know, as he said, as, as, as so that Trump could eject the people who were already there. Um, he got involved and interested in politics because he saw it as a way of networking by... <laughs> And by the way, the, the, the but, it, but it's in... pretty. I mean, but it is pretty peculiar. I mean, I, I, yeah. I, I, and we should get him back on again. I think he's an amazing analyst. But the truth of the matter is, it's unforgivable working for Trump. It was patently obvious to anyone by the time he came in that Trump was a badden. I thought he's. Um, I, I did think. I, I, every time I think of what he said about when he went for his interview with Goldman Sachs, and he had a a one hundred percent inflammable suit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back, 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 back from Scaramucci and Trump. You were talking about Donald Trump's legal cases um, yeah. before the break, and one of the things that I wanted to to look at is there's been some really interesting coverage, particularly in the New York Times, of this amazing, eccentric, introverted lawyer who's a junior lecturer at a, a university in Ireland, who's become the key to the Trump legal campaign. It's a man called Seth Barrett Tillman, and he's got. He looks actually a little bit like um, Robert Sapolsky. Our other amazing interview. He's got a big kind of uh, beard, and a lot of the stuff that's central to this is, of course, that this case in Colorado, which is being heard by the Supreme Court, is all about whether somebody can have office if they've been um, convicted of insurrection, where they can hold office have been. And this man has been saying for 15 years that the presidency cannot be referred, the president cannot be referred to as an officer. And this was a really marginal view. Everyone thought he was completely eccentric. Nobody cared. But now Trump's lawyers have really seized on this. Ooh, this because it's Irish, going to be this poor Irish guy. Yeah, exactly. It was actually an American who's moved to Ireland, but but absolutely critical because Section 3 of the 14th Amendment the question of whether or not the president is an officer is going to determine a lot of the case. Wow. Wow. So what, this guy's sort of done PhD style stuff on this? Yeah, well, he's, he's 60 years old and he's, um, he's what's called a sort of constitutional fundamentalist. He believes that every word in the constitution was very, very carefully chosen. And even though the common sense interpretation would be that obviously the president is one of the officers of the United States they're referring to, the fact that they don't explicitly say that means that they meant not to include the president as an officer, and that there are you know huge papers online. Oh lord! And, 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 and there so are Trump, so things... Trump, Trump suddenly believes in the constitution again. Exactly, Trump is suddenly a massive constitutional fundamentalist. Now, mm. the other thing I say you wanted to talk about was simply the cost of the things that he's facing, the amount of money this is going to cost him. Yeah, well, three three hundred million dollars plus. He's got 
they reckon with and then he, he you know and that will go up the longer he tries to avoid paying it this is sort of complicated bond arrangement that they have to do so 350 other, million dollars is what he already owes in legal bills no this would be he's been fined unbelievable yeah absolutely so he's already up to 400 million then we had the other one with the 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 woman that he um that he libeled uh over the sexual offense this is why to go back to our early discussion i i i don't agree with you that um that the the the, the authority the legal authorities shouldn't go after these things where they think there has been a breach of the law they know what he's going to say because this is what he's always done as the guy said as the judge said he's 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 got no contrition he's got no remorse and he's pathological. And I think over time, I just don't believe that the, I mean, the court, the, the people who are, you know, serious legal figures, they're, they're, I can't believe they take kindly to the stuff he comes out with. And then I thought it was, you know, just to sort of add to the whole cartoon character feel of it, literally the day after he gets, you know, fined for all this, he goes out and starts selling these, hideous gold sneakers trainers <laughs> <laughs> which i hope you didn't rush out to buy some guy paid eight thousand dollars and tell me about the trainers was that, do they have logos on them what are, well, are they like gold. MAGA they're trainers? gold they're gold yeah. yeah um they've got a t on them t for trump Lovely. um and he was sort of holding them and actually it's really interesting this goes back to the pathology of the guy according to the people who were in the room there was a lot of booing and a lot of cheering and he spent the whole time as he was holding these trainers, basically talking about how everyone was so excited by his trainers and by him being there. And I wonder if he sort of believes that, that anybody that is in his orbit, they're only there for him. And they're... there is something utterly pathological about him. The bills are unbelievable, aren't they? I mean, you know, he could sell Trump Tower, which he obviously loves, but he'd only get 56 million for it. Um, yeah. Even if he wasn't in debt up to his eyeballs. Which won't begin to touch this three hundred fifty million. He's talking can about. you can you imagine being this person who has to be in there as the sort of supervisor, as <laughs> somebody, some sort of public servant type person, is going to go in there and say you can't do that, Mister Trump. But meanwhile, I think New York Times has been pointing out, hasn't it, that he that a lot of his legal bills are basically funded by his campaign donations. So if you're an ordinary American sending you ten dollars off to one of his political action committees. Turns out that, you know, 10% of your money is going to pay for his legal bills. Is that legal? Is that legal? Because didn't, I have didn't, no, I, I, I didn't have Scaramucci, no Scaramucci said there was all sorts of law that covered the... the that what you can use this stuff What you can what use you funds can. for. Now, listen, shall we? can we close off with, with um, a situation that I was not aware of until I was in a hotel in Annecy um, in France and I noticed that the they going in for breakfast, the papers were there, and they all had this story, same story on the front page. This was the day before Navalny was killed, about Mayotte. And Mayotte is this, it's a French de département. It's the 101st French department, which that, that happened as a result of a, a referendum in 2000 and nine it became a department in 2011 so it's to all intents and purposes it is part of france okay yeah and can i just just as a small small explainer to people um yeah this is what made france quite different from places like britain that french guiana which is in south america guadeloupe and martinique which are in the caribbean and mayotte and reunion which are off the coast of east africa are Departments and regions of France. So they send, I mean, this goes back to the um, Boston Tea Party and no taxation without representation. These places are obviously not part of mainland France, and they were obviously places colonized by the French Empire, but they're treated as though they're actually part of France in a way that Britain didn't treat its colonies. So they have members of parliament, they all follow the French curriculum, don't they? So they the great joke used to be that they all had to read my ancestors of the Gauls, despite the fact they had nothing to do with the, <laughs> the Gauls at all. And and Mayotte's one of these. Back to you. So they have had they, they had this referendum to be a French department. But the the reason why they're suddenly all over the French media is because Comoros, which is formerly uh, French colonies, as it were, 
population 820,000. They had a referendum in 1974 where on a massive turnout, 93% turnout, 94.5% voted to be independent from France. Okay? Right. So you've got Comoros independent, you've got Mayotte wants to be part of France, and they, by the way, had a referendum back in the 70s where 99.4% voted to stay. That's really weird. How can, how can these two Under, places vote in completely different ways? Incredible. Back in the 70s? incredible. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah. so what has happened now or since is that Lots of people from Comoros have been going, which is bigger. Comoros is 820,000. Yeah. Uh, Mayotte's about 330,000. Lots of people have been going to Comoros and having children there. Okay. Yeah. Because, going from Comoros to Mayotte. Correct. To, to turn them into French citizens. So it's basically yeah. a way of immigrating to France. Correct. And getting all the benefits that you'd get of being French. So they have a small boats problem that makes ours look like, you know, nothing else. So this, pro this problem has been growing and growing and growing and growing. And so as a result, the interior minister, Gérald Darmanin, yeah. has announced that the, they will no longer, there will no longer be an automatic right to French citizenship simply by being what they, what they call droit du sol, the right of being born there on that soil, that is going to be removed. Now, that sounds straightforward. However... Well, it's, well, it's not, not straightforward, is it? Because basically, it's breaking the, the fundamental thing, which is that Mayotte is, is a bit of France. Correct. And should be treated exactly like the rest of France, and the laws that apply in France should apply equally in Mayotte. Correct. So he, he's basically treating them as, as this Department of France, as though it was a second-class colony. Correct. So what you, you are coming straight in there, Rory, with the left-wing perspective on yes. this, <laughs> and the Marine Le Pen perspective on this is, ah, well, if we can remove the right to droit du sol from the French people from the people who arrive in Mayotte, then why can't we do that to all these other people who are being born in mainland France? Right, exactly. So she's taking the other view. So she, she's, she's agreeing that it's exactly the same as the rest of France and using that to try to change everything in France. Correct. So part of the context of this is the way in which Macron, who you're always reminding us, um, was the master of this kind of en même temps this idea on the one hand, on the other, left, right, seems to be shifting to the right. And this is partly the appointment of this new prime minister, for a young 35-year-old prime minister. But it's also now that eight out of his 15 ministers come from La Républicaine, from this sort of centre-right party, including this interior minister you've just been talking about. Gérard is also from this, this right-wing party. And in this enormous news conference that he did in January with huge chandeliers, Macron was beginning to sound much more sort of like de Gaulle. He's talking all the time about order and respect, talking about how the Marseillaise, the, the national anthem, needs to be taught in primary schools. He wants people in school uniform again. He wants mandatory community service for teenagers, um, doubling police presence on the streets. And, and he kept coming back to this word, which I think is a kind of French Revolution word from Danton. He keeps talking about audacity. L'audace, l'audace, encore l'audace, toujours yeah. l'audace, this sort of stuff. Um, so this presumably is him trying to deal with the rising threat of Marine Le Pen, which we're going to be looking at going into the European elections. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Marine Le Pen, funny enough, when I was in France, she was she was quite active for her because Marine Le Pen doesn't do much. She's not like a... Uh, she's 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 not kind of out there all the time. She sort of picks her moment. She bides her time. She she bounces in and out of sort of different issues. But it was interesting to me that she she sort of leapt on this one. Um, and it's become a big debate now in Parliament about whether this droit du sol is going to be um, you know re removed from non French citizens, as it were, who are who happen to be born to kids who happen to be born to non French citizens on French soil. Um, and meanwhile, maybe we to close. We should. We talked earlier about you know legal cases against uh, former politicians. Mr. Sarkozy has been found guilty of illegally funding his election campaign back in 2012. One year sentence, six months suspended. Taken a long time, hasn't it? Twelve years for that to come mm. through. Yeah, amazing. Um, listen, just final one. I noticed that Amélie Oudéa-Castera, who's the education minister in Macron's government, 
Um, I wonder what she thought about this. That she, <laughs> she's been appointed as education minister. She's sending all her three children to a private school. I know. And then made a statement saying the reason she did it is that the state school where they were at was really rubbish and the teachers never bothered to turn up, at which point the state schools got very angry and gone out on social media saying it's a complete lie. Their teachers are very hardworking and turn up. She's had to yeah, apologize. It, it, so, I, think, I think it'd be fair to say that she is currently... Right. You know, the poll, the, the French are obsessed with the personality opinion polls week right. by week. She's not very high up the list right now. <laughs> right. God, Brilliant. Well, Alistair, thank you for that. Covered a lot See of ground. Soon. See you soon. Take care. Bye.